All right. Well, good afternoon. My name is Peter Honigman, um, self-defense instructor. Um, actually, I've been an attorney for about 25 years, but I've doing, been doing self-defense for about 35 years. Uh, so I do this sort of as a hobby. Um, but I've been doing that, you know, teaching uh, for about 10 or 12 years. And uh, today we're going to be covering some really basic self-defense techniques and dealing with some um, common attacks and just kind of learning some real simple stuff. We only, only have an hour and that's not a lot of time. So I want to keep it as simple as possible. A couple of things to keep in mind. You're going to be probably working inside in a small space. So watch out for things around you. Watch out for people around you. Try not to hit anybody, you know, family and friends, that kind of thing. Um, TVs and all that. Uh, also, be careful about if you have injuries or any sort of pre-existing condition, I don't want to get any hurt doing things. So if I say, you know, we're going to do this and you're like, I can't do that, then don't do that. Um, everything we're going to do, we're going to do very slowly. Um, the thing is when you're learning self-defense is you start slow and you work up fast. People want to do everything that, you know, full speed at the beginning, but that's a bad idea. You want to learn to do it properly. So you have to always start out slowly, like with many things. Um, and the other thing is at the end of the class, I will be sending out uh, an, an email with a, an outline of the things that we've covered and, and some other things we haven't covered. So you don't have to write anything down. Uh, it'll, most of it will be there, uh, remind you of the things that we're doing. Uh, and then I would also say that, you know, over this hour, there's probably going to be a couple things that maybe you say, oh, I really like that. So my suggestion to people is you need, you need to practice these things. You can't go to a self-defense class and then in one hour go, Oh, I know what I need to know. And then, you, you know, you get attacked in three weeks. It, it's not going to happen. Um, the only way these things work is if you practice, practice, practice. Okay. Um, so that's important that you practice the moves. And also you have to be thinking about it. Um, how would I respond if this happened? So when you see something in the news, you know, someone was attacked and this is what happened. Think, what would I have done in that situation? Right. Because this starts getting your mind in, in that process because, you know, self-defense is, is both a physical and a mental kind of exercise because many times your brain will just freeze if you're not really prepared to deal with it because it's a serious situation and it's a lot of fear and adrenaline and all this makes it very difficult. All right, so let's talk with a couple things before I get to the physical stuff. Number one, the most important skill that you can ever learn in self-defense is situational awareness, paying attention to what is going on around you. If I'm always looking at my phone and I'm not doing anything else and I'm a prime target for anybody, right? They just come up to right. me, they steal my phone, they hit me in the head, whatever. They can do what they want. If I'm paying attention and I'm looking around and I see people that look potentially suspicious, I have an option. Hopefully I can avoid them across the street, wait for them to go by, you know, go into a store, whatever. I have options. If I'm not paying attention, I have no options. I get attacked and I'm already got, you know, I'm in a bad position. So pay attention. And as we were talking early before we kind of started recording is listen to what your instincts tell you, right? Sometimes guys will say gut reaction and sometimes women will say intuition, whatever you call it. If you feel something isn't right or someone is kind of, you know, off or potentially dangerous, listen to that voice inside your head and get out of that situation. If you can't get out of the situation, we're going to talk about what can I do to prepare in case something's going to happen. Okay, so we want to be prepared. So that's situational awareness. That's number one. Number two is being able to de-escalate or basically talk your way out of something, right? So verbal skills, being able to communicate with someone. Um, it happens all the time. People have uh, fights over parking spaces, or there's a small fender bender where, you know, somebody wasn't paying attention, which happens a lot, but then all of a sudden becomes a real big fight, right? So now somebody gets really angry because you banged into their car and now they're really mad, all right? So you want to be able to try and control those situations the best you can. You prepare physically for a fight, but you try and calm the situation down. Things don't get better if you start yelling at people and, you know, you're swearing and yelling, you're raising your voice and you're being real animated. That usually makes things worse. We don't want to do that. You want to try and talk calmly. Say, I'm really, really sorry. I didn't mean to do whatever it was. Right. See, I'm not saying it always works, but it does more often than not. Usually doesn't make things worse. If the other guy's going to attack you, it's going to happen. But at least I'm trying not to make it worse. OK, so situational awareness de-escalation, being able to talk yourself out of things. There's a great book out there called Verbal Judo, um, and it's really about that. And it's, it's from a perspective of a cop who went into it thinking he could do whatever he wanted, and he ended up getting more trouble because he was very rough with people. And he learned that by actually talking to people and learning some different techniques, he could usually calm the situation down. And when he was dealing with people, he wouldn't make the situation worse because 
according to the book, his captain was getting really mad at him because he kept doing things that would just make things worse. He's like, you got to learn to do this job better. Um, and he actually went out and started teaching other cops on how to do this. So he was started out as a psychologist, went into, you know, being a cop and this training kind of came out of this. And so he got this book, he wrote Verbal Judo, and it's, it's a pretty interesting book. And you can learn a lot of stuff by reading it. I'll put that in my, my outline. So if anybody's interested, there's some other books too that I recommend. Okay, so situational awareness, de-escalation, but now let's look at the physical stuff, the stuff that's kind of what most people think about when, it, when you think about self-defense. How do I defend myself? First thing we want to think about a little bit is about stance, if I have to stand in a particular way. So you see my feet right now, this is a natural stance. I stand naturally. We stand like this. We talk like this from the side. It kind of looks like this. My feet are next to each other, you know, parallel. Not a good self-defense stance because forwards or backwards, I don't have the ability to catch myself. Let me shove me. I'm going to go flying backwards. So instead, what I want to do, for most people, you're right-handed. So you're going to take your dominant side. So for me, I'm right-handed. All right. So what I do is I put my right foot back and I bring my hands up. All right. So it kind of looks like this. All right. So they're about a shoulder's width apart. All right. Knees are bent a little bit. My hands can be up somewhere. Um, I don't have to be like this. I can't walk around through life like this, that would look strange and put people off, right? So I'm not going to do that. Uh, but if I'm in a situation where I'm talking, my hands can be like this. I can have them up. I can have them like this. I could be like this, or I could, you know, I talk with my hands a lot. Most of us do. So if I'm standing like this and I'm talking with somebody and all of a sudden some punch or something happens, I could just cover my head, right? Some people call that turtling. It's like a turtle pulls their head into their shell, right? People say, heads up, you're at a park. What do you do? You drop your head down, you protect yourself. It's a natural instinct. So using that natural instinct, here's what I would suggest you do, right? So I'm talking with something, someone, and I see something coming at my head, a punch, a bottle, a brick, whatever. I want to take my hands and I want to bring them to my forehead, right? So the idea is bring your hands to your forehead, put them against your forehead. Now I'm using the backs of my arms and I'm turning towards whatever's coming at me, all right? So from here, and I turn. Now, if I get hit with a punch or a brick or a bottle, it's going to happen on the outside of my arms. I can take that kind of abuse better than getting hit in the head where I'm going to get knocked out, right? So from here to here is what you're practicing. It's very simple, right? From here to here. Punch is coming from this side. I turn towards it so I'm protected, but I can still see. I'm not looking down. I'm looking at the problem. So I turn. Here's, for example, I'm using Bob. All right, Bob's a great example one, it's a great tool. Not everyone has room for, for a, a guy like this, but you know, for visual for you guys. So we're having a conversation. Bob decides to throw a punch from here. I move in here. I protect myself against the punch. Right? I could then be in a position to do something else, All right, which we'll talk about the something else. But this part's the most important first. Protect your head. It is the computer that runs the rest of your body. If you get knocked out, there's not much else you can do to protect yourself, right? So Keep the computer working, protect your head. All right, so good stance. All right, so one thing I want to go over just briefly. So wherever you are, when you're moving in, a, in this kind of position, I want to move. As I move around, movement's pretty simple. I want to move my foot that's closest to the direction I want to go first. So for example, I'm standing here. I got my left foot forward. I want to move forward. So I step forward with my left and I push off of my back. And then I'm still in the same stance. My hands are still here. I want to move backwards. My back foot moves first. And I'm here. So it's just real simple. Step and push. Step and push or step and slot. Okay. So that's, the movements are simple. If I want to go whatever direction I want to go, that foot moves first. So if I want to go that way, I'm not going to say right or left because I think it's confusing on camera. This foot's going to move first. I want to go that way. All right. That's, that's it. And I always want to try and keep my feet, again, in the same position. I want to try not to end up back in this natural stance where I'm too tall and I'm, I don't have good balance, right? So I'm always in this position. These are bent a little bit. My hands are ready to protect or to attack. Right? So stance is important. Where I Should keep my people, hands is important. Should people practice moving for a second? Sure. I would I would definitely recommend it. If you guys practice want to work with me a little bit, we're, we're in our, uh, you get in a good position, bend your legs, right? Shoulders width apart. Hands are up. Okay. From here, all I want you to do, you don't have to do the exact same direction. I'm going to pick a direction you're going to go, take a little step. Again, I don't need a lot of room to do this. I go the other way, that's, that foot moves first, the other one slides and follows. It's forwards, backwards, sideways, right? So just little steps. Most of the time when I'm doing this, it's probably a small step. Someone approaches me and I'm telling them to stay back. Hey, stay back. 
right? That's what I'm trying to do, take a little step. I can't see what's behind me, so I take small steps because if there's a curb or a bottle or something, I don't want to fall. But if I take a small step, oop, I hit a curb, or I hit something, I stop, right? I can't oh, always be looking I'm sorry. down. Can you, so when, if you're going forward, yep. even though your dominant leg is by, behind you, yes. if you're going forward, you should still move that leg first? If you're going forward, whatever leg is forward, in this case, I'm right-handed, so my right leg's back right. and my left is forward. It's the forward foot, which is going to be my left, is always the one that steps first. Okay. Pushing so off the back, okay? okay? <laughs> whatever foot is closest to the direction you want to go moves first. Gotcha. All right. That's so if I want to go backwards, my right foot is back, so it goes back. If I want to go forwards, my left foot goes forwards, okay? Same thing if I want to go sideways, whatever direction I want to go, that foot, you know, in this case, my right is going that way, so it steps first. I want to go left, my left steps first. Okay, I got it now. <laughs> so keep it simple because, again, simplicity is the key. If things become too complicated, they don't work, and you forget how to do it under stress, okay? Okay, so I've got my basic stance, so now I'm here, um, and I want to look at how do I... And Bob this way. So what are my, what are the weapons that I have with me all the time that are natural weapons? Well, that's my body, right? My hands, my feet. So we're going to look at a few things here. So one of the easiest things, so I teach a lot of seniors. I know seniors are going to be very limited in mobility and strength. So they need something that would be effective uh, despite all those things. So we look at the eye. All right. So one of the easiest things to do is to attack the eyes. So from this position, my hands are here. I'm trying to keep somebody back. They're coming at me. From here, all I'm doing is I'm reaching out. I'm sticking a finger in the eye. So think about keeping your fingers out. This is not like the three stooges where I just stick out two fingers, right? I'm not doing that. All right. My hands are open. So I'm using all my fingers. They have two eyes. I have five fingers. I should win that fight, right? One finger should go into an eye. All right. So I'm here. And I just reach out. And the other one's still protecting my face. Right? So that's what I'm doing, trying to get a finger in the eye. I'm not trying to pull their eye out of their head or anything. I'm just trying to get a finger in there, right? You've all had something stuck in your eye before, an eyelash. Wow, that really bothers you, right? A grain of sand, right? That really causes a lot of pain. Just imagine a finger or a fingernail going in the eye. Extremely painful, all right? So simple as you can be, right? One finger goes in, they close their eyes. It gives me an option at that point. I can either take off because I've done damage and they're, they're, they're blinded for a moment, or I can follow up with another strike because I don't think I've done enough damage. You have to assess those situations. I can't tell you what to do in every situation. It's all gonna be different. It's gonna be based on the facts of your situation, okay? So another way to attack the eye. So one was just sticking a finger out like this, okay? Another one would be, let's imagine for a moment, someone grabbed you around the waist or face to face or pull it, put you in a bear hug, lifting you up, right? So I grab, so I'm trying to lift me up. From this, I'm trying to keep the person away from me. So my palm goes on their chin and then my fingers were gonna rake across their eyes like a windshield, right? So it's kind of like this, like you're clawing across the eyes, okay? This one can be extremely damaging because I'm probably hitting all both eyes now with my fingers. Again, fingernails are gonna make it worse, right? So I'm keeping them back and I'm just raking across the eyes. Or I'm standing here, they move in, I'm trying to push their face back. Now I start raking across the eyes, okay? So that one's a real easy to do. I just turn it into a claw and rake, okay? People always say, what about glasses? And I say, what about them? They're not meant to protect your eyes. They're meant to help you see. All I need to do is go under the glasses and they'll fly right off, right? The other thing, of course, is with glasses, we haven't gotten there yet, but if you someone's wearing glasses and you want to strike them, right, you're just going to smash the glasses in their face and it just hurts that much more for them, not you, okay? Because if you ever banged yourself in the face when you're wearing your glasses, it's extremely painful, okay? So glasses don't matter from a self-defense standpoint. Okay, so we have finger poke, eye rake, all right? And then the other one's gonna be thumbs, okay? So for example, my thumb, right? It just kind of rotates in and it kind of goes towards the eye, right? So I'm just kind of pushing that thumb in the eye. Now this is more of, I'm just jamming it in. This one can be extremely damaging, all right? So it's just not going across the eyes. Now the pressure's towards the eye, right? So again, I could be pushing the guy back and now I just rotate it just kind of goes right into the eye, all right? This is a very strong strike because I'm really causing a lot of damage here. And I have seen a video, I've seen a couple of videos of, if you're familiar with UFC fights, 
Um, they're not, they have open fingered gloves, unlike boxing that are closed. And they've got a video where they've got people have accidentally, accidentally, most of the time it's accidental. I think sometimes it's intentional, but they get a finger in the eye. And most of the time these fights stop like that. Now these are young guys who are in great shape. They wouldn't stop fighting unless they have to. And you watch these things and sometimes it's just like a finger goes in there and then they, they stop. And to me, that's all the proof I need to know that that's, that's going to work against most people. Again, nothing is 100% effective. Nothing. You know, there's going to be somebody with it's not going to work against him. Um, so you always have to be prepared to do something else. But for me, it's one of the things that's probably going to work on most people if you can get it. All right. Target's not always there. Okay. So the other thing we're going to look at now is open hands. So how can I use my hands in an open position? All right. Boxing is really meant to be done with gloves and your hands are wrapped, right? Because when you go in the ring, what happens is, um, once they're wrapped, you don't have to worry about your wrist. On the street, you see all that rotation in there? The problem is it's very easy to hurt your hand. Plus, I'm attacking the head. The head is, is, a, is a big piece of bone, right? It's a skull. So when I hit it, it hurts, all right? So I don't want to hurt my hands more than I have to. Plus, really, these two knuckles are generally what I'm trying to hit with. It's a very small target. Women have even smaller hands. But even guys, it doesn't matter. You know, Mike Tyson, one of, arguably one of the best boxers in the world, you know, very famous story where he got into a street fight, no gloves or anything. He punched the guy through one punch. The other guy, you know, went down, but Mike Tyson broke his hand. So my point is, we don't want to break our hands. We want our hands to be useful, okay? Plus, if my hands are in fists, I can't do a whole lot of other things, right? So when they're open, I have other options. For example, I don't know if you know this, but ears, ears aren't attached very well. They kind of rip off very easily. So you grab somebody's ear and you rip it off. There's not much holding it on there, okay? So that's one option, all right? Um, when my hands are open, I have other things I could be hitting with. I can be going for the eyes. I have a lot of options because my hands are open. I can grab things, okay? Um, so just something to keep in mind. Punching is not normally what I teach people to do because it's not good for a vast majority of people. But if we look at open oh, hands... Oh, one of the, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Is there a situation where a punch might be better than an open hand? Yes. And generally it's because it depends on the target that you're, you're aiming for. So for me, when I tell people, the only time I really tell them that I think a punch is a good uh, option is when I'm punching below the belt. All right. Because now we're dealing with a soft target, right? So you look at someone who's a tall person, right? So now I got a guy who's six foot tall, right? And I'm five foot nothing. So now my targets, I have to adjust my sights lower, right? So what's, what's going to be closer to me? Well, the groin, the bladder, you know, it's all very soft targets. So if I'm going to hit that, I'm going to use a punch because now it's a soft target and you can do a lot of damage with that. So punching below the belt, which is generally why they don't allow it in boxing because of the damage it can do to the bladder because there's no muscle there. It doesn't matter what you do. You can't build muscle on your bladder. So punching that can be extremely effective. So that's the one time I recommend it. And we're also going to talk about using a closed fist, but in kind of a different way. So not necessarily a punch, but I will get to that. Good question. Okay, thank you. You bet. So open hands. So let me bring Bob back down. Okay, so another way, another um, target we're going to look at attacking is the ear, not ripping it off per se, but now it's going to be actually by using my open hand, the inside of my palm here, right? So they sometimes will call it a cupped hand strike. You cup it a little bit. So the idea is I'm trying to drive air into the ears, okay, to pop the eardrum, which is extremely painful. And it can stop someone from fighting almost instantly because it ruins your equilibrium. It can cause you to be physically ill, right? So if someone, again, let's say someone grabbed me around the waist, they pick me up, trying to carry me or dump me on my head. My hands are free. First thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take my hands, and I'm going to slap them over their ears, all right? Not the fingers, remind you. I want the palm because I want more air in the ears, right? So I hit the ears hard. And then from here, I take my thumbs and I drive them into the eyes. So it's a one and a two. One, two. So at home, if you want to just practice that, just think of clapping like this and then jamming those thumbs into the eyes, right? So it's one, two, all right? So one, two. It's a very simple motion, okay? Again, that would be if both my hands are free and the head's right there, I'm going to do that, right? If it's just one hand, which can be the case, I could be standing here 
here's my target or my, my bad guy. Target's gonna be the ear. What I practice is I practice using my open hand and slapping the ear, right? So I just practice that little move, which is the little slap. One of the things that's hard for us to not do is this. What people wanna do is they want their hand to come all the way back because they wanna get as much power as they can. This is not a power shot. This is more about speed, right? I wanna hit them before they hit me, right? So I'm here and I want my hand to not go backwards to go forwards because it takes time. And then in self-defense, I don't have a lot of time. So instead, I just wanna slap from where my hand is as opposed to going back to go forward. So when you're practicing these things, try to practice from where your hands are, right? So my hand's here and I slap. Notice, well, the other thing is, I'm also using my body because I do use a little bit of torque when I when I do things. Any sport you play, football, baseball, tennis, it doesn't matter. It usually requires body torque. Rarely is my body standing stiff and I'm not doing anything, right? So it's almost always requiring me to turn my body to gain power. Uh, so even with this little one, I'm still turning my body a little bit, okay, for a little bit of a, a power strike there. So again, that's my open hand slap to the ear, okay? So that's that is another good one. So we're focusing on the head. You'll, you'll notice that the best targets, the most vulnerable place on most people is gonna be right down the center, right? From here all the way down to my groin. Those are, those are really the most sensitive, uh, sensitive areas. So right now we've been focusing kind of on the head, right? The eyes, the ears right now. Um, but now let's look at the face and using the base of the palm. So this part here is what we're talking about, all right? Not up here, because this, as you can see, when I press on that, that kind of moves backwards. So when I'm doing a, a palm strike, what I do is I wanna bend this back and think of hitting here. It's similar to a punch because all the bones still line up like if I was throwing a punch, but instead I'm doing it with my palm hitting here, all right? So here's my target from you at home, right? You're standing here, your hands are up. I want you to just think of practicing hitting, like think about hitting a target that's yourself. I like mirrors. If you have a mirror at home, that's your one of your best training tools because you see yourself as the enemy, right? There, you're the attacker. So I can say, I'm gonna hit him in the nose, right? So right now I'm looking at myself in the camera and I can see my target, so I'm using that. Notice when I do these things, I turn, my hips, okay? So the whole idea is I need to generate power. So whatever I do, I turn my hips, okay? The way these strikes work, these are, you know, speed is important. So it's kind of like a cobra strike. It goes out and it comes back quickly. What I don't do is this. I don't extend my hand and leave it out there because that means I don't have a time for a second shot. So the idea is that when I hit my target, I want to be able to do it twice, right? So I want to hit him, bring it back. So I can do it one, two. And then my hands are also back to protect myself because most people aren't going to stand there and let you beat them up and not respond in some way, right? So as I'm hitting people, my hands are coming back to protect, right? So strike, strike. So if you're practicing this at home, again, just think left, right, right? You, you, I like to start with my lead hand. For me, again, I'm right-handed. So my left hand is usually my weakest side because it's not, I don't, do as much as I do with my other side. So I start with the one that's the lead hand that's also the closest to the target. And then I follow up with my right, which is my power side, where I can generate more power. My left is quicker because it's closer, but my right is more powerful because I can drive through the target. So that's why it's the left, right. Jab, cross, and boxing, right? It's one of the most basic boxing combinations you learn, the jab and a cross, or open up your hands. So you can still call it a jab and cross, just I'm using my open hands. Now, like I said, I like having my hands open. Why? Well, I hit him here, then I decide I'm gonna claw him here, right? I'm gonna slap him in the ear, right? right? So I can go from these strikes and I can convert to other things when my hands are open. If they're closed, it's harder because once you get those fists closed, they don't really like to open again because you stop losing the ability to do fine motor skills under severe stress, okay? Practicing with them open and doing other things becomes more natural to think about, all right, now I can go for the eyes and I can do these other things. All right, so what's the target on the face? Pretty much all of it is good, right? Because you've got the nose. If you break the nose, it causes the eyes to water, right? The nose is going to bleed. The eyes is going to water, so it's going to hurt. First time, it's going to hurt. Second time, it's going to hurt even more because you've already broken it. 
Um, the bones around the eye called the orbital socket, they break very easily. So that can get broken. The jaw, that breaks pretty easily as well from the side. Now the chin, all right, so you can go straight into the chin, or again, if we're shorter and they're taller, we have to change how we look at our target, all right? So I'm not gonna be able to hit the guy straight on because he's too tall. So instead, I'm gonna be coming upwards under the chin, driving the head up. This is extremely damaging because what happens is the head gets pushed back, up and back. So it's like a car accident, like whiplash, right? So it's a very effective strike when I'm striking upwards, right? The other thing is, as I strike, I'm extending my arm as much as I can. When I hit a target, I want to imagine hitting past the target. If I imagine hitting on the surface, what happens is my strike slows down. And by the time I'm here, it's not going as fast as it should. When I really need to think about hitting behind him, right? Whatever is behind him, then I'm going to get a more powerful strike. I really want to drive the guy backwards, so I hit through the target. All right. So when we're practicing, that's one of the things I work with people on is remember to hit through your target. All right, so with that in mind. Okay, so you guys are, you know, living in the city. Most of us have small places to work. We don't have all this equipment that I've got. So you're saying, well, well, how can I practice some of these things at home? I recommend one of these small target squares. I'm gonna call it a hand pad, a target square. This one's from Century, but they you can buy them from almost anybody. The idea is I want something that I can practice my most basic strikes without necessarily having to have a partner. It's great to have a partner, but we don't always have somebody. So the idea is I get this little hand square and it's got some straps on the back so I can put it in my hand and I can hold it. So now here's my target. Right? In a, in a self-defense situation, the face is going to be pretty close to me, right? We're not fighting at 10 feet, right? Right on top of each other. So from here, I'm going to hold it with my left and I can practice both hands. You should practice a little bit, even though your left will never, for most of us, will never be as good as our, our dominant side, right? The non-dominant and the dominant side. But you should still practice a little bit. I should still make my left be able to do a finger strike or a palm strike, the simple stuff. Because if I hurt my right, I got to be able to use my left. Plus, I still, one of these hands is, you know, if I have both hands open, they both need to be doing damage in a fight, all right? So do some practice with the left. So I hold the pad. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be able to practice, let's see, here we go, my palm strike. So from here to here, remember what I said, don't go backwards to go forward. So practice where it's at, right? So I wanna be able to practice striking it and I can hold it and do it whatever is comfortable for me. Another key to this is I'm not just standing static. My body's not, and you know, I'm not gonna be not moving. So I want, as I hit, I wanna think of moving forward a little bit, right? So I hit and I move forward, I hit, and every time I'm moving forward, I'm using my body and my momentum to get as much power as I can. I'm not a big guy. I'm like 5'9". You know, I'm not really strong. I don't lift weights and things. So I rely on speed and explosive power to be able to hit hard. That's what we want to work on for most people, which is going to be speed and using your whole body. The more you, the more you involve your entire body, the more power you get out of strikes. And usually that's enough to do damage to most people if you're hitting key targets, all right? So great tool that doesn't cost a lot, you know, 20 bucks, something like that. And it's easy to keep in your house, doesn't require a lot of, you know, space. And like I said, mirrors and one of these, you get a lot of, you get a lot of benefit out of that because a mirror also shows you what you're doing wrong. If you practice these things, you're like, okay, so I need to practice. What'll happen, one of the things people do wrong is this. They'll throw out a strike and they'll drop their hand. So they'll do this, they'll bring it back. I don't want my hand to ever drop. I want my hand to always be up. I never want to drop it because what happens? I'm, I'm open here, right? I'm, I'm open to being struck. So hands go out, but they come back the same way they came out, all right? So if you see it in the mirror, you're looking, you see how oh, I'm dropping my hands, all right? You can see you're doing things wrong. You can watch your feet. You need some feedback. If you do it in the air and there's no mirror, you're like, ah, this is great. I'm doing it perfectly. Well, you're probably making a bunch of errors that you're not going to see unless you're using a mirror, you have someone working with you, okay? All right, let's work down the body. Um, some other strikes. The throat. The throat is extremely sensitive. It is a, you know, a lethal uh, target depending on how you hit it. Uh, one way, to, if you open your hand up like this, so think of it flat, all right? You open it up so it's really wide like this. The webbing in here is soft. Now, Adam's apple, the throat here is pretty soft. This is a pretty good, so if you took this and you hit it, someone in the throat, so the idea is from here 
it's a very quick shot in and out like that. Okay, so that's your strike. Okay, um, my first instructor. Go ahead. With that, with that injury, like the being that this is the sensitive part of your finger, like in between the thumb and this, would that injure you? No. No? If you hit it, if you hit the throat right like that, the only way this is going to be a cause of problem is if you were to catch your thumb, you could pull your thumb back if you don't target it right, right? Okay. So that's a possibility. But if you hit where you're supposed to and it hits like this, it's not going to cause you any damage at all. The other person's going to feel all of it. All right? It's a okay. very effective strike. Okay. It tends to cause choking and coughing and gagging. All right. So you're probably mm -hmm. not going to bust any of this. Okay. okay. Um, but I say this, that it's still a very sensitive target, right? So you might hit somebody and you could cause more damage. So I do not recommend attacking the throat unless you're in a life or death situation. Because okay. if you break this, they're going to choke to death unless somebody comes in and does an emergency tracheotomy. Okay, that, so, that's, oh. so it's a very sensitive target. But in a life or death situation, that's one of the targets I recommend going for. Eyes, throat, you can't see, you can't breathe. It's very difficult hey, to hey, you know, hey. fight back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, Other thing I like you. about this is, again, if I'm dealing with a taller person, right, so I'm, I'm shorter and the person's a lot taller, this is a great target because, again, they're looking down at you, so it's very easy for me to reach up with the length of my arm. Most people have longer arms than they realize to hit that very quickly, right? So it's a very quick shot. Again, this is more speed than it is power. Um, and like I uh, my first instructor, um, told us a couple times where he used this and said it was always a very effective shot. Um, I've never used it anybody, but I do practice a little bit where we do kind of work a little bit in class and just for a little bit of pressure and you realize how, how painful that can be um, when you just do something like that. Okay. Again, and it's also very difficult to protect. Okay. If you want to do maximum damage to the throat, you hit it with something hard like a fist. So one of the questions that was asked was when would you punch with a fist? Again, if I was trying to do maximum damage, someone's attacking me with a knife, a club, there's more than one person attacking me, or this person said, I'm going to kill you, then to me, the throat is open, you know, open season. And then I would punch the throat because that would collapse that and that would stop them. Okay. So that's another time I would use a fist. Problem is, if you notice, the guy's got his chin down. Sometimes it's tough to get your fist in there, but this fits in still very nicely, right? So still easy to hit him in the throat, okay? All right, so that's kind of all the stuff here. I'd never recommend attacking the main part of the body because people can take too much abuse to the body, right? You can punch people all day long sometimes and you, you don't do enough damage in a short period of time. Um, Self-defense is about doing things quickly that allows you to get away. Right. So we're not we're not talking about winning. Right. We're talking about survival. So I need to hurt this person enough where they go down or they stop fighting and that gives me an opportunity to leave. So that that's why we're focusing on certain targets of the body. And the, the trunk of the body is it's just there's not enough there to hit and hurt for most of us. OK, um, so we kind of avoid that. And then we go down and we talked about the bladder and the groin. So one of the things we'll look at as far as. When I'm attacking the low low parts of the body, all right, so I'm really only going to look at the bladder, the groin, the shins, and the instep, the top of the foot, okay? We'll talk about that now. But if I'm attacking the groin, one of the ones that I'm sure everyone's familiar with is just using your knee, all right? Person's going to be right on top of you. I can't use my knee from a distance. It's an enclosed fighting weapon. Someone's in my face. They're grabbing me. They're choking me. They're right here. All I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my knee up high as I can and drive it into the to the groin and the bladder. One of the keys here is to point your toes down. Two reasons. One, if I'm kneeing somebody and I keep my toes out, I might end up hitting their shins with my toes. I don't want to break my toes, okay? Number two, I want my knee to go up as high as I can. And the more I point my toe down, it tends to help me bring my knee up higher, right? So someone's choking me, I drag my knee up as high as I can, all right? And it may not be just one time, it could be a multiple times I'm using the knee, all right? So I just keep using knees sometimes until I get the effect I want, all right? So again, knee is pretty simple, right? I just, I'm just bringing my knee up. So when you're practicing at home, right? You just wanna practice with your legs back. It's usually your back knee that's doing it the work because I'm in a much better position that you get a lot of power. I can use my front knee. It's just not gonna be as powerful, all right? Then you can switch your legs. 
and you can practice those knees. Another way to practice these are sometimes I'm grabbing somebody, right? So if I'm grabbing the person, as I grab them, I jam my knee in. So I'm pulling them towards me as I'm ramming my knee into them. I get more power out of this strike. I'm not just holding them in place. I want to pull them into the strike so it's much more powerful. If I just put my hands here and I hold them, I'm just using them for balance. But if I do this, it's like two cars hitting each other head on. It's a lot more powerful. And if I'm going to do this, do it well, right? So grab, pull, and knee at the same time. And then, as it says in the shampoo bottle, lather, rinse, repeat, right? So that's all there is to it, right? One, two, three. Not complicated, right? So knees are great, you know, the two, tar the two weapons in the body, we may, and we haven't talked about the other one, the elbow and the knees are actually your most powerful weapons. Elbows take a little more practice. I tend not to really work on those uh, a lot on the video ones, just because they also tend to be a little more dangerous because when they do make contact, you know, they're, they're extremely painful. Um, broken jaws and stuff happen in, in training sometimes. So, but I will talk a little bit about attacks from behind in just a second. Let's talk about kicks. The only kick I like to teach, all right, so there's, people will kick these type, teach this type of thing, which is a, a front snapping kick. I don't teach it very much to most people just because it requires good balance. Uh, it takes time to learn really well. Instead of trying to kick something that's higher, let's kick something lower that's just as painful, your shins. Everyone's banged your shin on something, right? And your shin is extremely sensitive. So, Think of turning your foot sideways and kicking with this part here, all right? So I'm kicking the shins. It doesn't require me to lift my foot off the ground very much, right? So here I've just, all I have to do is lift my foot just a little bit and you can cause a lot of pain. Now, Bob, who's got a plastic base, I don't usually recommend this, but one of the things I'll practice is just kicking that, that base with my foot. My foot is much softer than the, that plastic base, but that's a very powerful shot. People always talk about, kick him in the knee. Well, the knee's high. Right. I have to compromise my balance. What if it's, it could be wet, snowy. I could be on rocks. My shoes could be really slippery, whatever. I want something that's going to be easier for me to do. All right. So I adjust down to the shins because the shins, again, are an easier target to hit. There are two of them. All right. So go for those. It's best um, if you have shoes on. If you have shoes on, obviously it's so much better. If I'm at the beach or I'm walking somewhere where I'm wearing flip-flops or I'm just barefoot for whatever reason, it's still very effective. And the reason we turn our foot is because we don't want to break our toes. So if I kick okay. some of the shoes with my toes, something's going to break. It's going to be my toes, right? right? So instead, right. turn that foot sideways, kick with the inside of the foot, and you're still going to do a lot of damage. It's still going to be extremely painful for the other person. Okay. Right. Got it. All right, let's talk about from behind, all right? So the one time that I think elbows are really great and are almost a necessity is when people are behind me, all right? So someone comes up from behind me and grabs me, all right? So again, we're looking like a bear hug. They're coming around under my arms or over my arms and they're trying to grab me and lift me up or hold me. So someone's behind me. First thing I wanna do is I wanna make myself harder to lift up. So I take a small step to one side. As I do, I bend my knees. So someone grabs me. As soon as I feel a grab, I step, drop my weight. From here, I'm now going to use my elbows, right? So elbows are going to be, if my arm, arms are free because I've grabbed under my arms and my arms are free, then what I'm doing is I'm trying to hit the face with the elbows, all right? So I step and then I do one, two, three elbows. I usually do at least three because first one might miss. Second one might miss, but the third one usually catches them. We practice this a lot. And even when you know it's coming and you practice grabbing people and you, you bury your head so it's a little below theirs, by that third elbow, because I'm really turning my body, I'm still usually able to hit the head. But what if they grab over your arms? So now they grab over your arms and now I don't have the ability to do that, right? So Bob grabs me and my arms are here. Still take a little step. Anytime you take a little step and drop your weight, it's harder to lift things up. Imagine lifting a bucket. I have a big bucket, a five gallon bucket filled with water. If I wanna to lift to that bucket up, if it's over there, over there, and I try and lift way out here, it's not gonna happen. But if it's right in front of me, it's easy, right? I, I bend down, I lift straight up, no problem. 
As soon as it goes off to the side a little bit, it's much harder. That's what we're doing. We're making it harder for people to lift us up. So when they grab us over the arms, under the arms, I take a small step, I drop my weight. Harder to lift me up now. So now it gives me the opportunity, even if my arms are pinned, to, to do some strikes. So even from here, even if my arms are pinned, I can still usually get an elbow to the body, right? So I'm just trying to shoot my elbows back, okay? So if you can see me from here, as I step one, two, right? This is shooting my elbows straight back because their arms are over mine, so they're kind of pinned. But here, even if I turn, I still get more striking there, okay? What part of the body do you want to be hitting when you're doing it that way, though? Because you say dropping yourself, right? Yeah, so you're right. I mean, I am at this point, unfortunately, I'm a little more limited as my targets are kind of the body, right? So I am going to be ribs, chest, you know, I'm not sure what I'm going to hit, but I'm going to add another okay. strike to it, which is, which we didn't talk about, which I will talk about now is, I don't talk about using the fist as a fist, but I do talk about, we call it the hammer fist. The hammer? The cool. Yeah, the hammer. So it's like, it looks like the head of a hammer or I'm holding a hammer, but the idea is it's a hammer fist. I'm hitting with this part, the base, all right? So now from here, oh, we'll yeah. at the top, right? For example, I could smash down on his face, oh. right? That's pretty good, it's breaking the nose, that kind of thing. Um, one of the other targets, which isn't my favorite, but it does work. There are bones here, the clavicle, right? Some people break those like playing football and stuff. If you break that, Oh, that arm is no longer useful. It doesn't make his good. It's not going to be you know unconscious, but he can't use that arm because you need that bone, which is exposed. If you feel every, everyone feels up here, there's that bone and you can feel it. It breaks. It can't support the arm anymore. And the arm doesn't work. All right. So it's not my favorite target. It's kind of a secondary target. But if that were the case, he kind of stepped to the side or I moved over here. I would hit that to break that. It only takes about eight pounds collarbone? of pressure. Collarbone. Yep. Oh, Okay. Oh, that hurts. Very easy to break. So I break that. Other way I can use my hammer fist is the side of the head, side of the neck, yeah. ear, temple, doesn't matter. All these are great targets, right? The neck's got carotid artery, got jugular. You're kind of interrupting. There are also a lot of um, other pressure points in here uh, that work really well for a knockout, right? Yeah. And the truth is, this is all a weapon. This is a bone, right? So even if I go a little too far, that's okay. Because the bone still hits, right? The bone is makes contact here. It's a great knockout point. All right. So down, sideways, here. Even if he was this way and I was here and my hand happened to be a fist and I hit the side of the head, right? So Ooh. again, I'm just driving that fist into whatever's here. Back, head, right? Mm. Mix that up with my palm strike. Oh my goodness. One, two, one, two. Keep it simple. Two strikes, I just repeat over and over until I get the effect I want, all right? Okay, got it. Let's go back to the attack from behind. Someone grabs me, I step, I use my elbow, but now what I'm gonna do is after I've done my elbow strike, I'm gonna make a hammer fist, and then I'm gonna hit him in the groin, bang, all right? So I'm hitting uh, him, right? But much as I can, Bladder, groin, I don't care. Yeah, so man. elbow, hammer fist, all right? So one, two. And notice I'm going, I'm working with gravity. So I don't want to do hammer and then elbow. It takes too much work. So I just go elbow. Elbow, hammer. Got it. Two. The other thing that can be also a very good weapon is let's, if someone comes up and grabs you again in a bear hug, their head is right by my head. Mm. One of the best weapons is Back of my head. But, I use the back of my head as hard as I can. <laughs> the back of your head's really hard. It's hard to hurt yourself. Easy to hurt this person, okay? So sometimes the first thing I'll do is I'll practice or I'll teach, take a small step, use the back of my head, hopefully to smash him in the face somewhere, bang, and then elbow hammer fist, right? So it's kind of like three strikes. No one expects to get hit with the head when they grab you. It's very unexpected. So mm -hmm. one, two, so if you just practice. One, two, three, four. Four. Got it. Hammer. The the stepping. Step the head, down. Mm -hmm. Okay. So got let's it. do it again. So I'm grabbed. Take I'm a small step to the side. Use the back of my head. Elbow strike. Hammer fist. From this point, if I still don't have what I want and they're still holding on to me because maybe I missed my target or they're just really strong, I can continue hammer fisting. 
I can reach back and I can grab the groin and I can rip, which I like because it's very painful. Okay. Grab, rip. And then, like I said, the top of the foot, again, not my favorite target because it's again requires most people, if they're attacking you, they may not feel it, right? They're wearing heavy work boots or something that might not work. But I did all these things that didn't work. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my heel. And I'm going to drive my heel down. So as I point my toes up, it exposes my heel. And let's see. So here's the top of their foot. I drove, I drive that heel straight down on the top of their foot. Okay. I do these other things. There, their foot. Bang, hard as I can. Did, I'm using did, my did, heel did down. The, um, to get the more drop, points. right? Yep. Drop the head back. Yep. Elbow. Elbow. And then the hammer hammer, fist. And then the foot. Bam. And then the foot. If, that, if all that didn't work, then, you know, we have <laughs> something else, right? <laughs> but hopefully okay. you don't need it. anything else, right? Because a lot of right. the times I'll see the video of that and they'll show the person going with the foot stomp first. I don't like the foot stomp first because it makes me have to compromise my balance. It's not always effective. I want to use more effective weapons first so they don't know what's happening, right? So right. that's why I start with the head. Okay. All right. That's good. I like that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Um, so I think that's all the weapons, most of the targets of the body. Um, I want to cover some weapons and then that by that i mean weapons you can carry that aren't necessarily weapons they call them improvised weapons that you can carry with mm -hmm. you and then if anybody's got any questions okay so, let's start with something simple so i know new york is a little less permissive i haven't looked extensively into their laws but i know that it can be more difficult for, for example in illinois i can legally carry just about any size knife i want okay which is both good and bad because you know everyone's carrying a knife um but you know, if you can't carry those types of weapons or it's more difficult because of the law of self-defense, then you want to carry something simple like this, which is a Sharpie marker, okay? This one's oval shaped. Now, the reason I like it is number one, I can carry it anywhere on a plane, overseas, it doesn't matter, it doesn't look like a weapon because it's not, but I can use it as a weapon. Imagine our hammer fist again. When I'm hitting somebody with the hammer fist, what am I using? I'm using my hand. Instead of hitting them with my hand, I'd like to hit them with something that's not in my hand. So I put the Sharpie marker in my hand, I cover one end with the thumb so it doesn't shoot out and this part's exposed. So now I've got two inches here. That's what I'm gonna be hitting them with, right? Head, neck. This is extremely damaging. A Sharpie marker will cost you a couple bucks is a great tool. Right? It's really gonna drive deep into whatever you hit and it doesn't hurt your hand nearly as much, but you get a lot more pain on this guy, right? So again, even if my hand's here, I'm digging my fingers into his eyes. Now I'm striking. Right, I just keep hitting with that. You're gonna do a lot of damage with that. Other nice thing is I can have it in my hands. Let's say I'm walking down the street and I wanna, I don't want everyone to see it. Um, and now I'm talking with someone. So now what I do is I kind of conceal it. So now I'm not crossing my arms. I'm just laying one over the other and you can't see my weapon from here, right? So now I'm here talking to this guy. He decides to attack. I strike his throat. Right? I just start hitting him. Right? This one just kind of comes out like this, right? So you just kind of practice hitting with that. Even if the guy moves in, I go for the face, I hit with a weapon, right? And I can then transition to other things. Right? That's a little more advanced, but things you want to think about, right? If I'm holding it, how am I going to use it? What am I going to use my hands for? Eye strike, neck strike, palm strike, hammer fist strike, right? Whether I have something in my hand or I don't. This is probably one of your cheapest self-defense options. Other things you can use like that would be a flashlight. All right, so this is just a big flashlight that you can carry. What I like about it is it's got a button on the end that makes it easy to use. So when I'm holding in my hand where my thumb is, this is where I, how I turn it on and off. So as I'm walking down the street, particularly at night, I'm approached by Bad Bob here. He decides something isn't right and he decides he's gonna attack or I decide I need to do something first. I shine it in their eyes. Flashlights today are extremely bright. And especially at night, you shine it in their eyes, it's gonna blind them, give you a chance either to do some other strike or take off. Then this one, I don't know if you can see it, but it, it's got some very sharp edges on it. Sometimes we like to call those DNA collectors, right? Because you're gonna collect some DNA when you hit them with it. Right? So flash in their eyes, palm strike here, hit, hit, hit. I wouldn't wanna be hit with this, right? Strong metal, 
uh, it's going to cause a lot of damage. Again, it's not a weapon, but it can be used as a weapon. It's got a lot of other uses, right? You're out at night, nice to have a flashlight. And then last is pepper spray, all right? So this is a, like a jogging pepper spray, all right? So it's got a little loop on the hand. So if you're a jogger, it's easy to keep in your hand, or even if you're just walking, right? So even if my hand opens up, it doesn't fall out. Uh, it's got one little, now pepper spray is basically legal in every state, all right? Every state has uh, probably some different, uh, some have different requirements about the size. Most say it's gotta be, uh, one of these small pocket size ones. This is pretty much a pocket size one. Most of them just have a simple switch. So this little red switch gets flipped over here and then I spray. So basically the idea is you wanna adjust it in your hand so that when it safety's off, it's easy to spray in their face, okay? Now there are different types of pepper spray. There's a spray, there's a stream, there's a gel and there's a foam. The one that you generally don't want is the one that's called a spray. The problem is with the spray, it creates a cloud. And if you're outside and it's windy and it blows in your face, you just doubled your problems, right? So now I've got the pepper spray in my face instead of the other guy. Plus, it might also be maybe I'm standing here, Bob's there, I pull out my pepper spray, I spray, the cloud's here, the wind blows it all that way, and it didn't do anything, right? So now I'm in the same situation. That's why I don't like sprays. They're too affected by the wind. So instead, you want something that's either a stream, a gel, or a foam, because they're heavier, they're concentrated, they can work at 10 to 12 feet, all right? So I don't have to get really close to the guy. So you have it in your hand. Do not threaten to use pepper spray. Have it in your hand if you need to use it. If you tell them, I've got pepper spray, well, great. Then I can just cover my face. I can move in. I get the pepper spray. You know, I protect my face and maybe I don't get hit with too much. So don't do that. Okay. Don't tell them you have it. If you've got it, you know, give them verbal commands, stay back, stay away, whatever you need to tell them. And then they decide to attack, then you just pull it out and you spray. The best way to spray, again, this is because we're using a stream, right, is in a figure eight, right? So the idea is I'm not sure necessarily I'm going to hit their face, but if I'm doing a figure eight, something's going to get their face, okay? So practice doing a figure eight. The other thing is that people, most people who have pepper spray, I ask them, so when was the last time you tried it? And most people are like, never. I'm like, the first time you use a weapon should not be when you're under stress and your life is in danger, right? So take it outside and test it, you know, go to a park or a backyard or something where you got a tree or a can or something of it as a target, put it 10 feet away and practice using it. How easy is it for you to use, right? Well, if you can practice and you can use it, at least now you know how it works. Um, so do take a little bit of time. Uh, I do also recommend that you replace it every two years. Most, I can't get a straight answer. You know, most of the, most places don't give you a lot of input on to how old they have to be, but generally it seems like two years is a good rule of thumb. It's usually the propellant because it's made out of, you know, peppers, hot peppers, and the, the stuff that pushes it out, the propellant is what goes bad. And so it's basically the pepper stuff's still good, but the stuff that sprays it out, the aerosol goes bad and that's not going to help you. So, and you don't want to keep it in hot cars, you know, it can go bad there. It's not good in there either. Um, but the idea is it will not help you if it's at the bottom of your purse, in your pocket, or at home somewhere, right? So the only time it helps you is when it's in your hand. And it will work against dogs, right? So if you're worried about, you know, vicious dogs or attacking dogs, extremely effective there as well. And like everything, like I just said, it does not work on everybody. Some people are just, just they're not affected by it. I've seen videos of that too, where people get sprayed in the face. 90% of people or more are, are will be affected. It's immediate. It just causes your face to just kind of, you know, explode with all this mucus and your eyes react poorly um, and all this stuff. You feel like you're choking. I mean, I've seen it used on people in testing scenarios, like they sprayed them and they, they, uh, they reacted almost immediately. It took 30 minutes for them just sitting there feeling that they were choking and dying and with a hose running over the head to wipe all this stuff off for them to feel better. Okay, um, It's non-lethal, which I like. Uh, and it, like I said, works at a distance. And if I have Five guys who are attacking me, you know, I've got the ability to spray five guys much more quickly than I do to try and, attack, you know, defend against five guys, which would be uh, virtually impossible. So pepper spray, a great tool. Okay, questions? Can we use tasers? I don't know what the law is in... Um, New York for tasers. Some places do allow tasers. Uh, Illinois, you have to actually have a firearms owner ID card. So basically the right to own a firearm before you can carry a taser as a self-defense weapon. I'm guessing New York's probably similar, if not more controlling. 
And the problem with tasers is they are and are not effective. Even the police know this because when you shoot tasers, most of the time they, there are two ways you can use them. One has got probes that shoot out, right? So you use them at a distance. Um, sometimes they don't stick in the right place. Um, if you don't get the people in the right place, it doesn't work. Sometimes if they're wearing clothes, it won't go through the clothing. So it, to me, tasers are, you know, they're okay, but there's a lot of problems with them. Um, so they're not my top choice, even though, yes, they can be used certainly effectively. Okay. Okay. This was good. Because, uh, I mean, <laughs> I used to see people back in days punch with a hammer punch. I was like, well, why is there thumb in the air? Because I was always taught to, like, block, yeah. you know, and punch, punch, kick, kick, you know? But yeah. the techniques you're using is, like, it's, it's not so much um, energy you're using. So you can reserve yeah. that energy. Just Keep it simple. This make it easy, right? Scratchy thing. So I'm going to let my yeah, nails yeah. grow. Thank you. I can keep my nails yeah. on. Ladies, wear your stilettos. So you can slam that foot down. Mm. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yeah, those uh, those fingernails, you know, that's that's where they become just really just imagine getting fingernails across the eyes. I just can't imagine that that would be extremely painful. I think the fight would be over. Exactly. That's it. That's the intention. Yeah. So can I ask you a question? Do you help with like, um, because you know, there's a lot of human trafficking that's going on mm -hmm. with this work in the same situation, because I know that they say like drop your body weight, no screen like, yeah. or have a whistle. You know, when it comes to like drawing attention to yourself, right? There are obviously a bunch of ways you can do it because you know you hear a lot about personal alarms these days, whistles, yelling, you know, um, should I yell fire? Should I yell help? Okay. I just tell people make as much noise as you can, right? Because you want to draw attention to yourself so that other people will hopefully, you know, come to your rescue or at least call somebody, you know, call the police, do something. Um, my problem with whistles is I've got to have it. I got to be blowing into it while I'm also trying to fight for my life, which I think my hands would be better used to attack the person okay. I'm trying to hold a whistle. A uh, personal alarm might work because you can actually just activate it and then you could drop it. You could be doing whatever it's making noise. Um, I just tell people if your self-defense plan is I'm going to carry a personal alarm, that's not a self-defense plan, right? Because that's just one tool that if it fails or it falls and it breaks or you try and use it, it doesn't work and you have no self-defense skills that's not going to help you much, right? So have, you need multiple layers there, right? So learn how to poke somebody in the eye, hit them with a palm strike, you know, activate your alarm, but then be prepared to do other things um, because it's probably going to be necessary. Okay. Anybody else for a hog up all the questions? I still have more questions. <laughs> Calm down. Young men, you have any questions? You have any questions? No, there was that back there doing a little practicing in the back. So what about if if a person gets thrown in the trunk of a car? Yeah, you know, uh, a lot of cars, it depends on the car, right? So I know some cars have, I mean, I'm guessing if the person is intentionally planning to throw you in the trunk of a car, they're going to have a car that doesn't have an emergency trunk release, right? Um, so, you know, looking for that, looking for anything that you can use in the back of the car, particularly like if you can punch out um, lights, right? So if you can punch out a light, which tend to be pretty easy to do rather than trying to get the whole trunk open. You can usually punch out the light and then you can get your hand out to signal the people, right? So people see a hand sticking out oh, of a trunk of the car, okay. it's probably gonna draw their attention to the car, okay? okay. Um, okay. So that's generally what I recommend. I mean, it's gonna be probably be dark in there, right? So you're, you're doing the best you can. If nothing else, my suggestion is if you're not tied up and you're just in the trunk of the car, if you're tied up, obviously things are gonna be much harder. Um, you're going to be prepared so that when the person opens the trunk, you're going to have to fight for your life, right? You're you're mm -hmm. prepared so that when that trunk opens up, you're just going at the person, tearing for eyes and stuff like that. So, you know, right. that's kind of, I guess, what I would suggest in that situation. Okay. I thank you. I mean, I'm just, hey, this thing, yeah. all kinds of scenarios and stuff I've heard about stuff, you know, and the, yep. the children are not prepared. Thank you. I'm leaving the floor open. Before I keep Mr. Peters and myself, any more questions? Oh, come on. There's got to be some questions. No one else? Everyone's good with it? They're going to practice this? The All knees, right. the elbows, the palm strikes. 
Nobody a little yet? practice, you know, pick something you like, practice it. You know, I, 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 like I said, pick one or two things that work for you that you think might make sense. Practice those things because sometimes it just takes one thing. Someone's in front of the camera. We can't see the boys. <laughs> <laughs> no questions, young men. They're all the way in the back. So Leticia, Kristen. So my name is Sahara Dor D Douglas, Douglas, and another Catherine B. Nobody else have any more questions? All right. Well, Mr. Peter, I thank you so much. And um, I look forward to us having some more. Yeah. And that was, as you can show us, that yeah. poor Bob got like a terrible beating today. Yeah, he takes a lot thank of abuse. <laughs> I used to use my wife, but she fights back. So, you know, that oh. didn't work out so well. So, Oh, no. Yeah, she's also a lawyer and a martial artist. So that's, yeah, that's not good for me. Oh, I, lose, I don't you know, think that's going to go well. No. I don't think that's uh, going to go well. Uh, okay, but yeah, that. if you guys decide you would like to do it again in the future, you know, maybe sometime uh, in a month or two, I'd be happy to try and schedule another one for you guys. What's your website information as well? So very simple. It's uh, the name of my company, Best Defense Concepts. Dot com. That's all it is. Bestdefenseconcepts.com. There's some videos on there. You know, I'm on Facebook, so I'm always posting stuff about the most recent things I've seen in the news, um, certain things that I think are effective uh, ways to defend yourself. Sometimes things that I see that I think are just ridiculous uh, that people teach. Because if you go on YouTube, you're going to see everything from the good, bad, and ugly. And you got to really find things that are effective. Um, and sometimes it's just hard because there's just so much out there. Yeah, um, your website in the chat as well. Um, okay. everyone, if you can, just click the um the website information if you want to go visit it today. I advise you over there the summertime because you know back to school is going to start soon. Um, check it out. Thank you, Mr. Peter. Any more que Any more questions? Nobody sure you're positive. We appreciate you. Thank All you. right. Well, you guys stay safe. Thanks again. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. I'll send you a recording as well. Okay, I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, thanks.